All right, in this segment, we will reverse roles, and it will be Norm's turn to question Nick regarding Ray Kurzweil and his beliefs. So go ahead, Norm. Well, let me ask, let me ask you this, Nick. It's been a fascinating, and, and, and as I suspected, I'm learning a lot, and your, your breadth of your mastery of this subject is quite admirable and impressive. I want to ask you how you would, would you define it as being a human success if practically all vestiges of what we call humanity today, that may be problematic. We may not even reach a consensus on that. But suppose practically all vestiges of human humanity, as we know today, become subsumed in some successor entity, some transhuman, some posthuman entity. W would you be, pre be prepared to log that as a success, as a human success, even if humans as we know them no longer are there to claim that success? As long as it, there is a direct line of continuation, then the answer is yes. So what, what do I mean by direct line of continuation? I mean that we can trace, um, and, and the word direct here is key, we can trace that sort of intellectual and perhaps even somewhat physical continuation and evolution from us into those entities, whatever they may be, right? So, uh, and of course, the alternative is some kind of an extinction event, uh, which basically means that we would be uh, replaced by them, uh, just like, for example, dinosaurs were replaced by mammals, which is also a potentiality. Uh, and so, in that latter case, I'd not be too happy, obviously, and I won't be too proud of it. Um, but in the former case, absolutely, absolutely. And, and here's another key element to, to why I would be proud of it, because if we play our card, cards right, I think in the former case, there must be space for technologically Amish humans to survive. That's one uh, of sort of my sort of canary in the coal mine, if you will, uh, elements where, you know, People who want to reject that notion are allowed to peacefully coexist uh, with uh, people who choose to become transhuman and or post-human. Um, and so, for example, today, I live in Toronto, Canada, and just a couple of drive away from me, we have all kinds of amazing communities of Amish, of Mennonites, uh, and so on. People who have chosen basically to stay at sort of mid 19th century level of technological evolution. And I respect their choice. And I'm very proud that my country allows for those people to peacefully coexist with me in mutual harmony. And, and I think that's one of the key elements for me for, for a future society that I will be proud of. Are you committing perhaps? Well, first of all, it's, it's, uh, I, it's very interesting because I, I think what you're saying, humanity is a continuum. It is a thread of coherence. It's, no, it's not a fixed data set. It's a process. It's not an entity, I say in my manifesto. It's a process. It's a process. And, and I'm thinking of the analogy, Nick, uh, you know, that by the time we, we reach 70 or 80, every cell in our body will have changed, and yet we are who we've always been in some sense. We've, we've, the data set of cells has been completely, uh, you know, swapped out, and yet... We are who we've always been, in some sense. I don't know. I'm nothing like what I was when I was 18, let me tell you. Even we, me <laughs> and my wife we went to Bulgaria for Christmas uh, a year and a half ago to visit my family because I haven't seen them in about eight years. And uh, my aunt dug out a, a, a video of my high school graduation. And my aunt looked at it for 10 seconds and she told me, if I had met you at that time, forget it. There's no way I would get anywhere near close to you. So I'd like to think, whether for good or for bad, that I'm nothing like the the eighteen-year-old that I was. Well, we all have, you know, we all have views, you know, that we, we you know, uh, dark dark chapters we like to forget, and we certainly don't want them on tape. Certainly don't want the end up on them. Um, but because uh, they'll pop up everywhere, right, Dan? Uh, but you know, there's forensic evidence that you are who you were. Uh, Nick, I mean, your fingerprints uh, would, would substantiate that. But, but of course, you, you, perhaps you've undergone 
profound interpersonal changes, and I, I, I can well understand it. I think a lot of us what does What does my fingerprint say about my soul, as you put it, or my consciousness? Is it anywhere close to representing and or embody, embodying that? Especially if for a moment we consider my claim that we're not an entity, but we are a process. Because that's what the fingerprint is. It's an entity. Meaningless to me unless you're a detective on a crime scene. But it doesn't say anything about my character or yours or, or what you love and what you hate and what your dreams are and your accomplishments and who you are as a person. Well, I didn't mean I didn't mean to reduce you to, the, you know, or judge you in any way based on your fingerprints. But it is a forensic piece. It's a data point that that would that's unshifting, or at least certainly the FBI to my mess with it. They they use them for for the duration of our lives. But of course, we're much more than our fingerprints in our hair and or lack thereof or our eye color. Um, what I'm suggesting is even deeper here that we are in fact much more than our biology. That's part of our discussion and our disagreement perhaps here, right? The fingerprint is just one biological element. I would go on to argue that, you know, we are much more than our biology. So when I wake up this morning, I look in the mirror and brush my teeth and I see, you know, a sort of a bold white male of 38 and whatever. People tend to identify themselves and who they are with what they see in the mirror. I would say that's absolutely misleading and misrepresenting. And technology makes that very clear, especially if and when in, in the next few decades, all of those biological elements will become flexible. In an age where we can change our sex, change our age, change our race, change our color and physical attributes, then the question is, who is the real you? Who is the real Norman? Who is the real Dan? And who is the real Nick? And, 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 and that's what I'm going after. And, and that leads previously to, to your question and you saying, well, I can't give an answer to humanity. To me, that's the lesson. Because precisely you cannot give such an answer. And because precisely as I claim, and one of the reasons why you can't give the answer is because we are a process, we're not an entity, because if we were an entity, there would be an answer. But because we are a process that changes in time, there is no such answer. I would say it is only normal to, to, to consider and embrace that kind of process and to allow it to be redefined in each and every one of us. And that's why there is no answer, because your answer what it is to be human in general and to be normal in particular is only defined and given within yourself. I have zero control and I shouldn't have control. And the problems in our society arise when I try to enforce my view over who, uh, over what humanity is in general and who Norman is in particular. And that leads us again to, uh, you know, the Alan Turing case. We try to enforce on him what it means to be human, what it means to be man, and what it means to be Alan Turing. He didn't have an issue with it. We had an issue with him and his idea of who he was. And, yeah, and it, it went on to create this, you know, in, in subjective dislocations within him and, and great anxieties, and, and which may have manifested. But we covered that in the last section. That's a, that's a good answer. Nick, I think you're, you're saying that faith, I mean, you're, uh, you're, you're a creature of faith. You're trusting in the process. You're not trying to rigidly hold yourself to to a stasis. What you are today, you are you you you're submitting yourself to to the to a dynamic process. A and different way of putting that is, uh, I'm a creature of curiosity and ongoing self discovery, with an optimistic bent. Right. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, you can call it faith if you want, in the sense that. I believe uh, that, you know, we can sort of discover as we go every day and rediscover who we are in each and every decision point that we, we get into our lives. Uh, uh, and, and I'm optimistic and, and therefore, again, you can call that faith that, that we have the capacity and the ability to make that to be an ethical choice and for the better, not only individually, but also collectively. Uh, but 
that's as far as I'm willing to go on the, on the fate uh, sort of okay. <laughs> trajectory. We'll take, we'll take due note of where you where you start and where you begin on that one. Um, you mentioned the you mentioned the royal we a number of times. The royal we, and it's an anthropomorphic we. I think it's a pronoun that we that we as human beings use and ascribe to ourselves. And sometimes in the aggregate, it becomes a royal we. We this and we that. But we're talking about an alien intelligence that will evolve in in, in unimaginable ways. The very just the very notion of ascribing to this these new entities something on a, on a level of compassion or living with us in a, in a level of comedy, much as we as human beings, Amish live with uh, you know uh, Protestants and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, are you committing an anthropomorphic fallacy? Are you are you ascribing human emotions and 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 and, and harmony? I mean, what is harmony? I think it's a, I think I, what is harmony outside? outside the jostling of human nations and human tribes. Does it have any meaning? I don't know. Uh, who, who said recently, uh, the Martians arrived, I think it was Lanier, if the Martians arrived, they, they wouldn't know what a computer is. It might as well be a toaster. Uh, technology has social has a social context. It has a, 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 a uniquely human context. It's absolutely of no, it has no meaning uh, outside of a human context. So, well, I, I, I share your I, well, while I share your hope that what we create in our midst or allow to allow to be created in our midst uh, is will, will will allow us a place at the table. There's 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 no reason to believe that, none whatsoever. Well, so there is some reason. I cannot claim that there is. Uh guarantee or there's a hundred percent chance of success but i think there is some reason and that's the fact that we've been able to get to where we are relatively in good shape relatively unscathed overall i think on the on the better end of things uh but let me let me grab two two key words in in what you said there and that's uh, alien intelligence and harmony so let's start with alien intelligence first of all this will not be alien intelligence any more than humanity is alien to the earth. Artificial intelligence, were it come to exist, will happen on the strata in the environment that we create. Under the rules, at least initially, at least the initial conditions will be set by us. Uh, in a directive and in a preset, pre-programmed trajectory, at least initially, preset by us. So therefore, it will be nothing alien like coming out from deep space where we have zero control over and just like being kind of facing a fate accompli. But in fact, we have a lot of control over that process. Now, I'm not saying we are completely in control. I'm just saying that it's not alien any more than we, when humanity came to exist on our planet, we were not aliens, we were children of this planet. When mammals took over the dinosaurs, they were not alien. So if AI comes to exist, they will be no more or less alien than we are. Secondly, when you speak about that potential for harmony and what we mean by harmony, what I mean by harmony is symbiosis. Uh, uh, in fact, symbiosis is perhaps one step further than harmony and peaceful coexistence because symbiosis is basically the fact that you carry more bacteria in your gut and more uh, sort of living organisms than you have living cells of your own. And those two collectives exist in a status of dynamic biological symbiosis for mutual benefit. You benefit from them and they benefit from you. And if I've, what I've read is correct, they outnumber your cells, your own specific individual cells by a factor of 10. So I cannot guarantee the future will turn out great. There are certain risks, but that's what life is. All I can guarantee is that we have control over our own personal actions. So, as long as we are aware and cognizant of that fact and do the best that we can do, both individually and collectively, you know, we have a good chance, not guaranteed and maybe not even great chance, but good chance of 
making a difference and of coming out to a good end or to a good point. And, and that's why one of the key points here is not to surrender control over our own selves. And, you know, historically speaking, pessimists have never made a difference in the world. The difference was always made by some crazy person who was unreasonable and who thought, the hell with it, I can make a difference and I can change this. And as, uh, you know, it's been said, all progress depends on the unreasonable person because the reasonable person adapts himself to the world and the unreasonable person adapts the world to himself. And of course, therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable person. And the visionaries are those people who don't see the world as it is, but as it should be. And then they start the change inside of themselves. And hopefully that catches on and then other people and other people and other people. And then you have cumulative change on a grand scale. Right. So would it be happening for sure? No, I can't put that, that faith. You know, maybe if you believe in God, maybe God or some other external force can be that sort of uh, referee that makes sure that the game is played right and well and it ends up in a, in a good outcome. But I don't, my faith don't spend that much. And, and I also don't see us as being that special. Maybe we would succeed, maybe we would fail. I hope we succeed. I'll do everything I can that we do. But there's no guarantee. This is life. Well, you mentioned, uh, well, for, uh, for the record, I want to say one fish have found a niche. They're, they're still an existent species, even though they were a baton passer. Uh, reptiles are still very much alive and well, and they're obviously uh, they're directly linked to rep the larger reptiles and uh, dinosaurs of yore. Okay. So there are niches. Uh, we don't have to necessarily be centra central to the, to the cause. That's sort of a Copernican uh, fallacy, I suppose. Uh, let me ask you, you mentioned pessimism, Nick. I want to ask you about the Garris' uh, uh, notions or his prediction of a gigadeth Bartolet war in mid-century. That's a rather dark vision. Do you expect, Nick, there will be a muscular Terrans uh, recoil, a, group, a large group of people on the planet who will absolutely resist this singularity moment and view it as the cul-de-sac of human existence. What I expect is that uh, change doesn't happen without friction. And when you're talking about fundamental radical change, then you're talking about fundamental radical friction. How far and how deep that will go, I cannot say. I, I'm not one of those who can predict the future, and I can't even like begin to doing to, to be doing that. What I hope is that with my work and with the work of other people, we can mitigate the negative effects and minimize them to the best degree possible. Whether I'll be successful or not, time will show. But uh, so again, we have control over our own choices and our own decisions and our own actions. I suspect there will be fundamental friction. I, I suspect there will be huge disasters. I suspect, you know, powerful technology will fall into the wrong hands. I suspect large numbers of people will die at certain points, uh, whether deliberately uh, or just accidentally. Uh, that's nothing new. When you look at it, uh, sad and horrible as it may be, that's nothing new uh, with respect to human history. Uh, unfortunately, all major changes uh, have been accompanied by, 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 by those events. So I don't expect a smooth ride. I expect a, a, a rocky ride, and I just hope it's not going to be as bad as... as, as uh, uh, some people have said, like Hugo de Garris, for example. Very good. Uh, so much ground has been covered, and and yet so little has been said. I mean, it's such a, it's a, just a, it's 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 a convergence of everything that it, it means, and nothing. There's no safe ground. So so hard to define things as fundamental as human humanity and progress and modernity and. Uh, trying to think of a, a follow-on question there, Nick. Um, you're obviously an optimist by by nature. 
uh, by human nature, I might add. And uh, what do you think about the, uh, There's a definition that I find in transhumanism. It's, it, 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 it talks about transforming and improving the human condition. Yeah, so let, yeah, is that a, is that a, that, that definition seems a little bit not quite on target. I mean, we're not just improving the human, that's rather parochial, is it not? Are we, we are participating as a species in a continuum, an evolutionary continuum, that may or may not have a place for us in the future. Should we be brave enough and forthright and noble enough to accept the fact that we may not see the terminus of this process, or as as Kevin Kelly calls it, it's an infinite game, not a finite game. Sure, yeah, I agree with him. That and we're probably a finite game. player in an infinite game. Yeah, and and, and so so let me, let me just address a smaller point first. So you said by nature I'm optimist, and that's, that's an observation. So let me tell you, from my point of view, that's a wrong observation. It's something that I have had to work with or are at for a very, very long time. It's like my father-in-law is one of the best uh, jazz clarinet players in Canada, a double Juno winner, which is like the Canadian version of the Grammys and stuff. If you see him on the stage uh, improvising, uh, you would say, wow, this comes by nature to Bob. He's incredible. But the guy has 36 years of practice to get to that by nature. So, uh, and if you know his life, you know, you would kind of figure out that it's not really by nature, but by sort of a stroke of luck, many years of practice, and, and because he didn't have the embouchure to be a trumpet player too. So, you, you know, so what you think is by nature usually happens after a long period of directed or self-directed in those cases, evolution and strife. Uh, anyway, that's the smaller point. The bigger point to, to your question about the human condition and transhumanism. So I don't entirely always like the term transhumanism because in a way we are, we are transhuman and we always have been. And so on the one, it's a double-edged sword. Like on the one hand, it's good that we have a term which kind of sort of attempts to embody this kind of process forward from our present context into the future. On the other hand, embracing that term too tightly undermines what that we have done already the exact same thing since time immemorial, since we left the caves, basically. Uh, and, and so the moment we adopted fire, we started wearing clothes. We have become transhuman. We have transcended our biological limitations. Our human condition is that we can only have a conversation around the fire in the savanna or in a cave. But our science and technology has allowed the three of us to get together over the internet through space and time and have this conversation and immortalize it for generations to come, right? Whether for good or for bad. So, so this is where transhumanism in, kind of embodies that kind of overcoming or transcending of the human condition, because the human condition is only contextual. It's about right now. It's about the present. So if you are on the savanna or in a cave, that's the human condition. And people say that's what's normal. If you are in the 21st century here today, then everything up to here is normal. That's the human condition. But beyond that, you see, then that's getting scary and dangerous and kind of apocalyptic and hubris. But before us, it's okay. And, and that's also geographically contextual because our development, as we know, is divided between East and West and North and South. So it's highly contextual, subjective, and therefore not very full of meaning. And exactly pointing to what we have been touching multiple occasions, that humanity and therefore the human condition is a process, but not an entity. It's not an entity because you cannot pin it, pin it down in time. You cannot pin it down geographically. You cannot pin it down scientifically or linguistically as a definition or in any way. All you can do is show it directionally as a trajectory, as a process, and usually in historical terms. Well, as you say, if, if, if uh, as, as you said, if, if humanity is in fact a continuum, 
a state of dynamic movement, uh, then transhumanity is, 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 is not a very descriptive term because the prefix itself is it's kind of a sub movement within a within a larger movement. So so that, that, that makes sense to me. It's nothing new in a way. It's nothing new. Uh, but it, it, would you would you would you agree though the singularity is a is a radical uh, crescendo to use a musical term or a, a a radical break? Do you see a discontinuity in this continuum? That, that the singularity point delivers to us. Sure, potential. One of the scenarios is definitely that. That's the Ray Kurzweilian, Ray Kurzweilian uh, scenario. But I also see other scenarios where it's not necessarily so radical. It's not necessarily uh, such uh, so so divergent. In other words, yeah. uh, in other words, as as one of Amazing foresight uh, experts that I've interviewed, and, and a great science fiction writer, by the way, that I've interviewed on my sh on my show, uh, named Carol Schroeder, said once, "The singularity is a lens. It's a very useful lens, but it's even more useful to have other lenses in your bag and switch them every t once in a while. And that would give you a lot broader perspective than simply having a single static lens that you keep looking at the whole world at." Well, it's interesting you say that because I think Jerome Lanier compares transhumanism to Marxism. It is a it is a ravenous and eclipsing worldview. Everything must be viewed through the prism of transhumanism, or the Marxists were similar that way. They crowd out other worldviews. So that, that's a very interesting that lens analogy. It, it, it resonates with that Lanier idea. So if I understand what you're saying correctly, the Kurzweilian singularity is not the transforming and improving of the human condition. It is a radical cessation. Of, it's, a, it's, a, it's a distinct break from the human condition, and it, it brings on something entirely different, with, to which, what, what do we call that? Do we, is that what we call transhumanism? What well, is we, it? we call it singularity because we can't see beyond, and it is radical. Uh, I don't know if it's positive or negative. We cannot see it. Staying within that realm of, of, of the Kurzweilian view right now, and as I say, I'm trying to make the point here is that that's a narrow realm than the one that I've embraced for the last couple of years. Yeah. And I'm trying to broaden the perspective from there considerably because I think it's only one vision of the future. And we have and we should have many other visions of the future. Um, uh, so whether it's good or bad. We can't say because it's a singularity. Now, Ray Kurzweil also has been very clear that he cannot guarantee it will be good, and he's been clear about the dangers. But he himself is a what you would call a natural optimist, perhaps, and he sees the positives very strongly, very, very much so. So that's why you know uh, many people in in Silicon Valley has probably most of them have, have embraced uh, that kind of a worldview. Uh, and to me, that's also a double-edged sword. And, and that's why I think it's very important to bring in other views and visions, uh, because we don't want the whole world, of, we don't want the future to be subsumed by a single vision. Uh, I, don't, I also want to just quickly, Nick, it's somewhat related. I want to say that there are groups of Christians and Muslims, particularly classical Muslims with, with a very positive view of science and progress, who view the who view transhumanism positively. It's not it's not endemic to Judeo Christianity or the uh, Abrahamic traditions that, that there's a natural antipathy towards it. In fact, some people view it as part of this you call it the theological unfolding of, of what it means to be human. It's, it, it falls within God's plan. It can't yeah, be we can, separated. Yeah. We have the Omega Point people, uh, Teilhard de Chardin. We have Mormon Transhumanist Association, even, which is very interesting. Uh, yeah, we have all kinds of views. Yeah, you're much better versed in the, 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 the schisms and, and, and flavors and the wafers. It's, it's, you know, it's very uh, edifying to me. I appreciate that. Yeah. So is that, uh, do you have anything else, Norm, to ask Nick, or should we move on to the next segment? <laughs> I think uh, I could ask Nick stuff all, all, all day, uh, but that probably concludes it, yeah. All right. Um, uh, in the next, yeah, so you, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, in the next segment, then, uh, I will uh, ask a few questions that are a bit more Kurzweil-directed, and then we will close the 
debate with uh, uh, both men giving their remarks in the final segment, and that'll come up in a moment. All right, in this penultimate segment, I just want to ask uh, uh, both men to be a bit brief uh, uh, with any uh, responses they have. Uh, and I'm going to uh, get back a little bit more focused on Kurzweil. And uh, I'd written a review of uh, the Barry Ptolemy 2009 film Transcendent Man. Before seeing that, I'd known Kurzweil mostly as uh, uh, the the organ, uh, the, the fellow who made the Kurzweil organ and uh, uh, a few other things. Um, one of the things that was pointed out in the Ptolemy film was uh, the claim about Kurzweil and his... Uh, supposed infallible prediction rate uh, uh, of things that he had said. And I know afterwards, this was about two and a half years, three years ago, maybe when I saw the film, I looked online and there were two or three websites that uh, really went into depth about uh, the supposed uh, predictions that Kurzweil had made. And I know a lot of them were uh, really tore into uh, some of the predictions that a lot of them were fuzzy a lot of them were, well, if he predicted something happened in 2001 and it happened in 2008, he considers that a hit. Um, this is, I guess, more directed towards Nick, although uh, Norm can briefly comment. Uh, I've noticed that a lot of those websites and a lot of those things that I had bookmarked uh, a few years ago seem to have disappeared. I'm just wondering uh, if you, what your view about Kurzweil's prediction record is and he seems to be very touchy about acknowledging when he's missed. Uh, any comment from Nick and then Norm? Yeah, so so two things here. So first of all, specifically on Kurzweil's predictions, I am not like one of the sort of, how can I put this? I'm not one of the, uh, I, I don't even know how to approach this. I am not convinced that, that Kurzweil's predictions are as accurate as he would like them to be. Um, that's only my own personal view. Um, and I actually, when I was at Singularity University, the first time when I spoke to him, he was on the stage and I asked the question and I was stupid enough to bring in a specific quote from a specific event and date and time that he had given about another date that he had made in a specific prediction. And then I asked him in that retrospect whether he was correct in that prediction. And he said that he was wrong in that specific case. So again, he's one of those guys that he can see when he's been off. Okay. Uh, now, but the more important part for Kurzweil to me personally is not the timeline. Now, you're saying some people said some things he said that were going to happen in 2001 happened in 2008. To me, as a philosopher, that's meaningless. You know, I don't care so much about the timeline, to be honest. Like, even when we talk about issues such as, you know, uh, indefinite life extension. I'd love to, to live uh, indefinitely and, and not to fear about aging and death. But that's not so important other than selfishly to me. The more important issue is, the philosophical question is, how does humanity deal with a development like that? What does it mean? What are the implications? And the timeline is not so relevant if you look at the global cosmic sort of timeline of things. And that's the philosophical issues that I am interested in. And therefore, you know, whether he was right in 2001 or 2008 or even 2038, as long as those things happened, I am much more uh, willing to, to, to give him the benefit of the doubt and sort of not focus too much on the exact dates. Okay, Norm, do you have a comment? Yeah, you know, there's there's people in the there's stock market prognosticators who are great stock pickers, uh, but they're horrible uh, when picking, you know, uh, uh, cyclical trends, more macro trends. I think, um, I, I, I agree with Nick. I think these issues are of such, so large scale that uh, you're kind of over-interpolating if, 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 if you uh, hold them to, uh, you know, a seven-year, eight-year discrepancy. What does he say, 20? 2045 is a singularity. I think that's his current 
his current prediction. I've seen sing- the singularity out as far as 150 years uh, from different people. Uh, so, so I think it. I think that timekeeping pales, as as Nick says, in, in, in when you look at the, the the immensity of what is probably going to happen at some point. So, so approximate times will do. There's also what is it? The the uh, the Maze Garot law that uh, every favorable technology out uh, prediction will fall within. The lifetime of the predictor, you know, there's a little bit of ego, and I want to be there. And my goodness, what does he eat? He, he, he ingests about 200 pills a day, does he not? To to make sure. According that he's, to the film, he's That's dropped right. a lot from that. He used to do a couple hundred. Now he does a lot less than a hundred. I think the Google HMO just finally put a kibosh on that. They, yeah. just his bill, his prescription bills were just exorbitant. But well, let let, let, let me move on to the next point, if I can. Okay. Uh, because the reason I brought that up is because it, it relates back to the title of the, the debate. Because uh, a lot, of, a lot of I think uh, the leveraging of his his uh, career uh, in in terms of finances has to do with that prediction rate. So I think it does matter when you're talking about predictions of, of things and you you're and you're you're off or you only get two out of five predictions and try to claim that. Uh, I think when you're looking to, to uh, harvest capital for future ventures or to get hired by a Google, I think that does matter. But I, I, you mentioned the 200 pills, and in the film, there's a funny, funny morbid kind of segment where uh, you, you see uh, Kurzweil talking about how he reprogrammed his body through his pill regimen, and then uh, within about a minute or so, he has a heart attack and is taken off to a hospital. And I know that a few times I've read online, some uh, biologists uh, and also medical doctors have talked about how uh, Kurzweil has no particular understanding really about fundamental biology. And yet he has also leveraged this to try to, uh, there was there was a, a woman called the, like uh, uh, a girl who was trying to give advice online, uh, the, the health chick or something, uh, and she got called on it. I'm wondering uh, if either of you just have a brief comment on, do you think that Kurzweil really has any clue about how biology works? Because it seems to me that at least in the film and in things that he's written, he is clueless. Either one. Well, to me, uh, uh, I've spoken to Ray a, a number of times on a number of disciplines, and he blows my mind every time when we start going in depth in almost any discipline. So if you claim that he has no clue about biology, I'd say uh, either go talk to him or if that's not the case, just investigate that claim and learn a little bit more. Uh, and I think it's, it's a ridiculous claim personally. Uh, more specifically to that movie and what was discussed there. So he claimed to have reprogrammed the biology of his body with respect to diabetes, right? It's a very specific claim. Now let's dig deeper. Diabetes is a fundamental issue uh, uh, in your individual personal biology, metabolic issue that has implications for all of your systems. If you are capable of kind of reversing uh, your condition and or minimizing your uh, diabetic condition to the point where you don't take insulin and you don't take all the traditionally prescribed uh, uh, medical treatments and your uh, effects of not following that classic medical advice show all your biomarkers to be within the norm and in the upper end of it, then I would say that your claim has been substantiated with respect to reprogramming your biology, right? So in other words, you are taking measures and steps and supplements or other ways uh, with nutrition and exercise and stuff. to mitigate the effects and reprogram your body. And I, I think that's, that's a, that's a s- statement, that's an accurate statement for me. Now, with respect to the fact that he had to undergo open heart surgery, that's a totally different system. And, and, and uh, you know, it's, okay. it's an unfortunate, tragic event. And it goes to show what I would claim. And as I have claimed before, that there's only so much we can do to control. And okay. we do our best and whatever happens, happens. And that I personally wouldn't be so brave as he is to say, oh, I would make it until that and that time and that and that day. Because there's things that happen. 
So this one I'd be on your side here a little bit more. But he specifically never said that he can control that. Norm, comment. Well, just quickly, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated with, with, with Kurzweil's fascination with mortality and immortality. His father failed to reach immortality because his father is deceased. Reyes seems hell-bent on achieving immortality. I think it'll be 95 in 2045 or something. He plans to make that date. There, there, again, we're back to this, not, not to overly go Freudian, but there's, there is a fixation. I wonder if, you know, transhumanism may just be a stocking horse or a facade for, for a, man, a man's underlying obsession with death and the prolongation of life. It's, it's just an interesting psychological subtext. And, and I'm not a biologist beyond that. I really, I can't speak to his heart disease and his cardiovascular system, nor can I speak to his, his diabetes. But I, I, I admire his, his uh, vigor and his, his determination to, to hang in as long as he can. I hope he sees that uh, singularity. Okay, uh, one final uh, question. One, then, note, uh, one note, if I can make here, yeah. though, and I, I'm kind of butchering the quote, but I think that's nothing new, because as Friedrich Nietzsche, I think it was, who pointed out that all art and science is basically men trying to come to terms with, with our own mortality. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask one final question, Ray Kurzweil, then I'll give you both a, a, a bit to just summarize uh, the debate. Um uh, uh, one point, though, uh, I do think that uh, a thing that uh, Kurzweil has neglected as far as this 200 pill regimen is that he could very well be uh, self-deceiving himself with a placebo effect. But um, I interviewed se some years back a philosopher named Mark Rollins who talked about what he called the river of cells. Uh, and uh, uh, Norm, you had mentioned about how all the cells in the body's change, and depending on which... Uh, Biologists you speak to, it's anywhere between four and a half to every seven years, every atom in your body is replaced. And uh, 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 Nick had mentioned the direct line of continuation of human accomplishment. And one of the things that I found very disturbing about Kurzweil and the idea of uploading the self into the internet or whatnot is he doesn't realize that once his body is gone, it's gone. It's the old thing about Jason and the Argonauts. If the Argo goes around for 10 years and every bit of it is replaced bit by bit in every port. That's not you. And the moment that, that you, even if you make a perfect copy of your brain and upload it, that thing is going to be something different. It is not the fit because that Ray Kurzweil or you or I are embodied within our bodies. We see and, and touch things. And I think one of the things with AI, I actually saw a video of a, a kid from a website called Think Fact or a YouTube channel called Think Fact who had the very opinion that more scary than AI is maybe uploading a human being uh, or human consciousness into into uh, into the internet uh, and and how that might affect things. So I have one of the things I have problems with is Kurzweil doesn't even seem to philosophically understand that he's going to be dead, and this thing, if even if he could upload his mind, is going to be a Kurzweil copy. And it's going to be something that could very well be subject to psychological strains that we cannot even imagine. It, it could go psychopathic very easily, knowing that it is not the real Ray Kurzweil. I just wanted to, to ask Nick, and then Norm, you can comment. This is the final thing. Um, it seems to me very troubling that someone like Kurzweil, who is a very learned man, doesn't even seem to get this fundamental philosophical difference about what his own existence is. Comments? I don't see that myself either, to be honest with you, uh, for a number of reasons. So first of all, that's an issue of identity. And, and as we discussed and touched upon that, discussing the, the fact that in my view, we are a process, we're not an entity, and that, uh, you know, my fingerprint doesn't say anything about me, and all of our cells change, and, you know, I'm nothing like what I was when I was 18, and what happens to the real me when I can choose my sex, color, race, age, etc. Uh, so identity is a, is a substantial issue. I don't think it's a resolved issue to me. Um, we uh, don't have a good way to, to define it, in my opinion. Uh, as far as uh, that sort of upload can go mental or psychopathic, etc. Well, people go mental and psychopathic very easily. 
um, I don't know if you've been in extreme situations, but you know, um, I've been in a few, <laughs> yeah. and and, and uh, I imagine most of us have. And yeah. in my, it's my observation that people are not so hard to go mental and psychopath. So I don't see how how that's any different, whether you are embodiment in in biological strata or in digital strata. Uh, and so, all right, uh, yeah. Noam, if you have a final comment, then Nick and you can uh, give you a final statement. So a, a comment on on the on my last point there, Noam, from you, and then Nick well, can close. Okay. Just, just very quickly, I mean, just the, the, that whole notion of porting yourself up, and, and, and all, it's just fraught with all sorts of, 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 of issues, as, as uh, Nick said. I mean, uh, if, if, if Nick is correct, and humanity and, and our identity is, is, is a continuum, what are you, you going to take a static rendition of that continuum and store it in some per machine purgatory for the rest of eternity? It frightens the hell out of me. I want to no know part of it. I'm, I'm more than content. To live my my three score ten and then depart the planet, and I, I'll I'll trust that my soul, my consciousness survives. I feel we're simply mediums of our consciousness, and but but I'll I'll take a chance on that. I do not want to hang around and become like the uh, the ghost in a machine. Yeah. All right, um, Nick. If you have a final statement. is something like this a ship is safe in the harbor but that's not what the ship is built for a ship is built to cross the oceans or to travel the oceans humanity is not an entity it is a process and the world is changed by the unreasonable people, by those who dare to leave the safe harbor and go into the unknown sea. The reality of the situation, as far as I can see, is that that's an inevitability. The question is, there are no safe harbors. Change is the only thing that doesn't change. So if you sit in the harbor and you think that you're safe, that may be true for a decade or two. Eventually, time comes to show you that that's not always the case. So sometimes it's better to be proactive and leave the harbor and just hope for the best and, and be unreasonable. And the will, the human will, I think, is that which allows us to fight fights which, under all reasonable estimate, we should lose. Okay. That's my kind of predisposition for uh, for life uh, and, and optimism, if you will, uh, and, and determine uh, and, and sort of dogged determination to, to to keep going. And so, just to, to finish, to me, the the only thing uh, people feel. Uh, let me see what's what's the what's the the best way to to not butcher the quote. Uh, I think it's Mary Curie who said that nothing in life is to be feared and it's only to be understood. And I and she said that now is the time to understand more so that we may fear less. We fear change. We always have. And, and I am among those people who do too. But the more we understand the process, the potentiality, the futures, the options, the risks and the dangers, the less we can fear it, the more we can direct it, the better and bigger impact we can make on it. And I think that's as far as the choice that I have made for myself. Okay, thank you, Nick. Uh, Noam, your final statement? Yeah, I think it was, I think it was Heraclitus that said uh, the same rivers never cross twice. And that's very true. I believe that. But I wonder who crosses that river or who recrosses it, who, who, who attempts to retrace their steps. I believe there is a fixed locus of who we are, who I am. I struggle with the semantics of it. I don't know if it's a spirit, if it's a soul, if it's merely an ego, a perishable ego that, that will perish with my body. Uh, I, in my Christian vantage, I prefer to call it a soul, but that's, 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 that's open to semantic debate. But I believe I am who I was when I started, 
and I'm and being who I am when when I end. Uh, that doesn't mean I haven't been buffeted, stimulated, and diverted experientially. Uh, but I believe in the fixity of identity in some core sense. Uh, call it a psyche if you want. If you want to use a Jungian term, uh, I am. Yes, I am made. I am. I these. I am made nervous by these people who are trying to surpass themselves. And and I and I, as I've tried to point out, in some cases, those who are, appear to be escaping themselves. And I wonder if they don't have unfinished business in their subject self, which propels them outwards, and then inflicts these macro adventures on the rest of humanity when they really have a lot of work still to be done at home. Uh, and that's where charity begins at home. Uh, it, 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 they're fascinating individuals. They are the, 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 the surpassing intellects of our era. It, I'm, it, it, it's an exhilarating field. I can well imagine jumping out of bed every day and throwing yourself into it. It's got all the primate accoutrements of excitement, exuberance, competitiveness, with maybe a couple of Nobel Peace Prizes lurking in on the horizon. What's not to like? Uh, the implications I, I maintain are uh, we don't know what technology is. Kevin Kelly himself, a renowned technologist, as recently as I think last month said, he still grapples with what it is. Uh, it, it is it is a strange force. It, it, it pretends to allow us to think of ourselves as its manipulator and, and, and as its director, but I think that's a charade. Uh, it has its own equal, uh, it has its own evolutionary designs and its own aspirations, and, and we have served it well and brought it to this singularity. It could not have done it without our, our assistance and our administrations. What it has in store for us post-singularity, I have no idea. Whether we reach a singularity, there's a lot of skeptics on that. I, I certainly don't have the expertise for that e either. I, I am wary of it. I'm excited by it uh, at the same time. I have huge storehouses of ambivalence towards it, uh, and I may be fear-based. If that, that's, a, that's a somewhat of a, a negative read, but it may be true. I, I have apprehensions, there's no doubt. Uh, 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 at the end of the day, it all remains to be seen. And will, will I be here? I don't know. I don't. My pill regimen is nowhere near what Ray's is. Uh, I'm happy with my mortality, content and resigned to it. And if that sounds defeatist, or you know, as as uh, uh, Daguerre's would say, you know, overly Terrans, then that then, then so be it. I'm happy being a human being uh, with very limited augmentations. I wear glasses on occasion. Uh, as I get older, I'll probably have more augmentations. Uh, but, but for the most part, I'm content within myself to be here for a period of time and pass the baton, not to a transhuman, but to a fellow human, to my son, to his friends, to, to the follow-on generation. And may, may they do with the world and, and the universe as best they can, and I, and I wish them well. Thanks, Norm. Uh, this debate is now over, and tomorrow I will actually be sticking with science. I will be talking with three experts on geology about the lives of James Hutton, Charles Lyell, and Louis Agassi. Uh, I just want to make two points, because uh, the first is a comment Nick had made earlier about the cockroach, chimp, and human on an island. I know I'm going to get some fans who are going to nail me on that, and uh, it should be noted that cockroaches are not nearly as... as uh, 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 strong and, and survivable as uh, they, they are uh, because they basically spread around the world with human beings and the, the food and he warmth that we provide to them. And the second point, uh, I think at the end of the day, singularity or not, the victor is going to be lawyers because I can imagine in the year 2075 when we do have AIs that there's going to be human AI intermarriage and the conservatives of this country uh, are going to be saying, well, it, it's always been reserved for humans alone. We can't have AIs and 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 humans ma intermarrying. And so I think at the end of the day, uh, it's not going to be a robo apocalypse. I think uh, the lawyers are going to win. So that's just my own cynic point of view. And again, thanks to Nick and Norm. Yeah.